In this episode of the Mental Health Toolbox, we are talking with Dr. Argelis Ortiz, who is passionate about helping leaders of color seek upward mobility. So let's go. Hello Thrivers and welcome back to the Mental Health Toolbox if you're meeting me for the first time. My name is Patrick Martin and I am on a mission to help 1 million people improve their quality of life through actionable tips on personal development. So let's do it. Welcome Dr. Ortiz to the Mental Health Toolbox. So happy to have you on today. I appreciate you making time. Um, Would you like to let our listeners know a little bit about who you are and what it is that you do? Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Patrick, for having me on. So my name is uh, Dr. Ahelis Ortiz, and um, for the past few years, I have been a professor at Cal State uh, LA and Cal State Dominguez Hills, uh, primarily in the departments of social work. Um, I have a, a MSW, and with that degree, it allowed me to teach um, in those departments. Primarily, uh, my focus is uh, leadership management, um, macro social work, what they call it. Uh, I do have a clinical background, but I'm more lean towards sort of that, that bigger macro scope uh, policy and leadership. Um, but I also have a, a doctorate in education, and that allowed me to, to kind of begin my own consulting firm uh, about a year or so ago. We formalized it with my business partner and I. Uh, we were for several years just doing things in tandem or, or just separately, but uh, we just decided to go for it uh, a year or so ago. And we focus on uh, small to mid-sized organizations to uh, ensure that they have the tools and the capacity to, to make it and, and survive in this day and age. Um, one of my passions is to, to support leaders of color and uh, who are seeking upward mobility in their own careers, but also in, in their new career path. So that's a little bit about what I've done. And, and, and I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son, I'm a little bit of everything. So it all encompasses of, of who we are, who I am. That's fascinating. How fantastic. Um, oftentimes, social work is considered like a terminal degree, a terminal field. You went and got your doctorate in education. That's no small thing. I mean, you talk about it like it's, oh, yeah, I just, you know, I just tacked <laughs> that on. But that's, I mean, that's a big deal. Right? No, I think uh, folks who, who kind of asked for my journey, I, I've always had a triple or fourth threat. Uh, I, I enjoy being in front of people. I enjoy teaching. Um, but I also do find uh, a gratification with, with uh, just the, the principles of social work, right? Start where people are at, um, teach a person how to fish and, and kind of live forever. Like, like those type of principles really in, uh, um, are dear to me. But, and community building is huge um, for what I do. And then education in general, I, I like living in that pocket of sort of empowering people, teaching people, and, and those degrees have so worked out. Uh, the second question, question people ask me often is, is why didn't you go get a license? Mm. And it's, it's always a good follow-up question because my end goal has always been higher academic, uh, academia and, and sort of starting my own um, organization. And, and license does help. Uh, so if folks are on the route, like don't stop. Uh, but my path was just closer to, I was already in management. I was already in leadership. I was already kind of ahead in the curve. Um, and not to put it this way, but but if I would have got the license route, I would have really had to focus on my craft and, you know, two, three years, but I would have kind of um, sidestepped for a while. And, and again, knowing that my end goal was going to be uh, running something, it, I was looking more for that that doctorate in, in the long run. Yeah, certainly. I think um, for many people going into social work, they don't really understand the, the lay of the land. I certainly didn't in terms of their, op, you know, the options. They have in turn how they how they wield their MSW degree in terms of do they you know, going the clinical route, gerontology, mm-hmm. hospice, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. think tanks, politics, like you said, veterans stuff. affairs, you know, yeah. child welfare, right? Mm-hmm. There's there's certain tracks that people get, especially if you associate with a specific program, right? But depending on where you listen in, in the in the U.S., right? Some are definitely child welfare heavy. Some are really policy heavy. Some are really clinical based, and that's all they do in those programs. And great, I mean that that's what they're intended for us to to really build that expertise. Um, yeah, yeah. So I mean, the fact that you already had the end, you know you began with the end in mind, and kind of worked backward, knowing you wanted to do macro, you wanted to do policy. I, I'm sure it helped help you maintain clarity, so you didn't get too derailed. 
in terms of yeah and, and it was always like uh whether, whether i was doing an assignment or whether i was in work it was always like i was pushing more community organizing pushing more community type theory versus individual and and that was always tough right because if you're doing mental health services you you have to really zero in on what's happening with that person and think about outward um, so yeah it was it was interesting for people who supervise me to always say all right well let's let's tone it down how are we going to really relate to this it's not always a big old macro situation let's really get to the the bottom of that person that family set or, or unit and you know it's it's been it was a bit fun but it's also kind of who i am right it's it's that bigger picture thinker doer yeah absolutely and i think following your passion is really really important because that's your superpower you know if you like the macro if that's what you gravitate toward that's how you think you can affect some real change on that level i think that's one of the biggest complaints of you know being in the you know face-to-face -face, you know fee for service kind of thing, direct service, it's, you know, sometimes feels very defeating because you feel like mm -hmm. you just can never quite um, address these social problems. I mean, we, you are one family, one person at a time, right. but to really affect change, you know, there people have to go to battle on the policy. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think both sex or both sides are needed, right. Whether you're, you're, in love and passionate about helping one person at a time, right? Like diving deep, uh, um, making sure that that person's life is, is changed forever, making sure they don't repeat cycles. I mean, that, that's invaluable uh, expertise. Um, and then there's the other side too. Like if you wanna go on the, let's get to the root cause of the problems, let's, it, it is it racism, is it systemic? It's like, what is it? Then you kind of need that other type of people to, to go on the bigger macro route. So, but I think they both work it's it's when I, honestly it's when one is in the other side or the other shoe by accident right like when a macro thinker happens to be a clinician happens to be in day mm -hmm. in day out and they're just thinking often of policy reasons or the opposite if there's a super individual type uh, clinical person and you happen to be in a systemic change opportunity then it's really difficult because you're not you're not thinking in that wavelength right but but both right. are super needed I can imagine too if like if your passion, like if you're in a position like that, where you feel like your hands are tied, it could lead to burnout, it could lead to, to frustration, yeah. resentment sometimes. Yeah. And I think even harder than that, it, it's sort of being um, unempathic to problems of people's needs, right? Like, oh, here comes Steve again, or here comes another lookalike Steve, or, mm -hmm. you know, whoever. Um, we start seeing the reoccurring mirror over again. And we start, we start thinking about that people's needs are, or we just sort of start self-diagnosing just real quick. Oh yeah, that's this. And then now forget about really what's going on with that individual or that community or, or that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's also uh, a, a possible pitfall that people could fall into. Yeah. So I'm curious, did you jump right into teaching or what was your, what was your journey like? No, thanks for asking. I, I think I've always had a way for like, I got to practice the tools in order for know what I'm talking about, right? So um, my undergraduate was even in, in creative arts. So it's, it's a version of liberal arts because I knew I was, I wanted to teach in the long run. That was uh, uh, 2003 or so when I graduated. Um, graduated San Jose State, moved back to LA and in the LA area around that time, having a teaching job was difficult, similar to now where there was a lot of kind of recession type things or the, there was a hiring freeze. And what I thought was gonna be a, a, a teaching gig turned out to be my first opportunity to work in, a, in the nonprofit sector. And I enjoyed it because I was working as a case manager in, in a gang evolved sort of gang prevention program. And I just had to reframe, it's just another way of teaching. I'm teaching a kid or a family at a time versus a traditional classroom. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, let me, let me go for that for a while. And I really enjoyed it, but I was that person. I was doing individual work when I was thinking bigger community macro. Mm -hmm. um, a few years into that, uh, uh, with the support of one of my mentors and, and a professor at, at USC, he kept on telling me, you should go back for your master's. You have all the right school, uh, skill set, you just got to go back. And just like everybody, like, no, not for me. I'm done with school, mm -hmm. forget it, right? Um, but then I realized and I started seeing the supervisors around me, I started seeing where I wanted to be in five, six, seven years. And yeah, they all had masters. They, yeah, maybe an MFT or MSW or uh, MBA. Um, 
So I started realizing, no, no, I got to go back. I got to go back to school and, and do that. So, you know, it, it looks like if you look at my resume, it looks like I had five or six years in between each next degree, but it's purposeful. I want to really put it to work. I want to see, is this going to be really the end degree? And, and it hadn't, right? It was always like, okay, now I kind of literally master this. The next thing is ready. And it, it was always kind of looking ahead and looking around me. Well, who, who doesn't have what? And, and who's doing the decision-making? And who's making the moves? That, and that's how I got to align myself. And, and now I'm here. But it, it was, when I say now, it seems daunting. But it was a 22-plus years journey, right? Like it's cumulative. It's, 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 it's a lifetime for people. Wow. Yeah. That, I mean, I know looking back, it's like, oh yeah, that, that happened, you know, but in the moment it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of work. It's encompassing, all encompassing, right. When you're in it. And did you, I'm curious. So you did your, you went into your MSW, right. right. With the, with the intention to do policy, but did you jump right into your master's in education or what were you doing in the in between? So, yeah, so then I was doing more leadership management and work. So I was a director and then I was a regional director. And then I was a, a vice president for, for org. And, and it was always kind of leadership positions. And the more I saw, I was primarily in, in child welfare and, and, and uh, uh, community type work, community development work or youth development work. And um, the more I saw people that were the higher ups or people like that, I, I realized they had either a PsyD or a PhD or they had these higher degrees. Um, but the social work one didn't really quite align with me um, then or, or maybe now, but it's, it's still focused on social welfare issues, but I've always been interested in, in that intersect within education, first gen needs, and then just community. Um, and again, maybe the programs I was looking into, but some of the PhD type programs really social work, sorry, social welfare focused or clinical focused, or um, uh, there's another perspective like social entrepreneurship focus, which is fine. But I, I wanted the nexus between education, social needs, social support people needs, and then kind of first generation uh, issues. And, and uh, the um, education of doctors actually provided me that opportunity to go back and forth between both circles. So that really gave it, positioned you, like you said, to be able to speak to the the right audience from the right the right platform to affect right. change. So yeah. I'm I'm really curious. Um, what does that look like, and what are some of the challenges that you, you hear that you quickly identify as being a problem with first generation immigrants? In general, to be honest, Patrick, it, it's just lack of representation, lack of people that look like us, act like us, talk like us, um, a, few feet, a few feet ahead of us, right? I'm not even talking about the president or whomever, just, just people a little bit ahead of us that uh, have quote unquote made it and, and are, are showing some sort of blueprint to people. Uh, there's quite a bit of people who are successful. There's quite a bit of uh, first gen Latino Chicano folks that have been around, right? And, but to me, honestly, that they're whomever I'm thinking about, they're a bit more re removed than the people that are three or just three to five years ahead of me, right? Like if they, those folks could just show me in this lifetime, this is what you should be doing. You should be uh, studying up, you should be networking, right? Whatever these quote unquote tips are, would be great. Um, so yeah, I think that's the biggest one is representation. And there's also, because I go through this sometimes, it's, it's, it's just a, 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 that this creep kind of behind of imposter syndrome, right? Like I don't belong here, or this is too big for me. I really need help from a, of a, of a, of a non-first gender, right? Uh, or a non-Latino, like, like I get this stuff as well, right? But I tend to have uh, support around me that says, no, no, you got this, or have you talked to so-and-so before? Or, you know, like there, there's a way to get that resource um, and not that all gen first gen, people freeze but it, it, it tends to be overwhelming right it tends to be super like self-defeating and then and just you just kind of move on and, and you go into the next best thing that you you know how to do so i think those are the two biggest things it's, it's lack of representation and just having that looming imposter syndrome happen around us often that's really um impressive too you've taken your own lived experience with that negative voice in your head the naysayer um, the mm -hmm. imposter syndrome, which I think everybody gets at times, but from that unique perspective, you, you're able to leverage that. And then as you're teaching, as you're coaching, you're mm -hmm. able to use that as a way to, 
to highlight the importance of having a roadmap to combat those negative assumptions, right? No, no, correct. And I think I don't, I often say, you know, I, I, I'm one example. I'm not, I'm not the example, right? I'm one example of how it was done. And I'll share with you kind of where I fell, how I got up and all that. But, but it's my example. It's been my journey. Uh, but I also realized, Patrick, that I'm, that I'm also privileged, right? I'm a male, right? I, I'm fairly educated now. I, I, I've always been an extrovert, right? All these are things that not everybody has in their tool belt. So it is a privilege that I have that is, is not equal to everybody else, right? Uh, uh, I've always been sort of outspoken to what I need, to what people need. And that's really difficult for people, right? Like, like saying what you need is saying it clearly. It doesn't matter what it is, right? It's difficult for folks. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly what I do in my teaching. I tend to use me as, a, as, an, as an example. I tend to use my life as a whiteboard, right? Like it's not the end all be all, it's just one version. Uh, but then I also try to, as, as much as possible, and, and people's availability, I like to bring people on, like yourself, or people who, who are been doing the work for a while, so they can show my students, they can show my colleagues that there's other ways, right? Like, like you don't have to be just a quote-unquote therapist and never think about podcasting, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, don't, you don't have to be just a, Outside a the box. person who, yeah, yeah you know, and, and, and give it a try, right? Like, nothing, nothing worse is going to happen if you if you don't try it, right? right. If you start Experiment. trying, maybe fail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep open mind. Yeah. Big time, right? Yeah. And, and you know, you, you don't expect to fast forward and be Joe Rogan all of a sudden, right? You don't fast forward <laughs> and be some of these right, folks, exactly. right? You got to put in the work, right? Like, mm -hmm. I think I, I don't see too much of his content, but I do see clips or whatever, and I'll say like, I don't know, episode 2800 or whatever number he's at, <laughs> right? That just means that's how many hours, mm -hmm. times, whatever, prep work, times, whatever, this one person has done for their one craft. Right. Mm -hmm. So same thing, right? Same thing for, for any of us who want to excel in our one craft. Absolutely. So I, yeah, again, a very powerful message. I'm wondering where, what was a turning point for you? Like um, whether that was kind of a hurdle or a point where you said, oh, okay, I was, I was going this direction, but now I'm going to pivot this way. This is, this is what I need to chase. Yeah. Interesting. Cause you know, it's always by, Kind of circumstance right like when i when i came back from uh san jose state i i met my by now wife over there but my girlfriend and and we moved down here to la and we came here so i came back to la for love right so i kind mm -hmm. of follow her back and then good reason. all my my connections yes all my connections were were in san jose state and, and uh, so i came back and then i realized man okay if what's what's the bigger picture that I want here do I want to be so narrow-minded that I only want to teach and I only want to teach high schoolers and social studies or whatever that was and and, and if so then I had to chase that really hard um but I realized that I want to empower people right so that I make it like the denominator is sort of bigger and then when I was doing the, the gang stuff and I was doing more uh, nonprofit work I said okay well what, what's my next level and what's really the basic denominator okay now I want to empower communities so then I did the master part. And then it was like, well, then I've been doing that for a little while. What's what's the next step? What is the most common one? And, and it was always like opportunity because of work or opportunity because people were coming like uh, uh, needing my, my help or my services. And uh, that's kind of how I started the consulting stuff is that people would ask me similar work, right? Hey, can you help me do this? Hey, you're really good at that. I saw you this in this conference or whatever. So I was like, hey, people are asking me, and I, I got to start monetizing this. You know, I got to start figuring out how do I make this a package and how do I uh, excel with my powers? And, and, and that's, it's always been a, a paying attention to what people are telling me my strengths are, but also be really honest with myself. And that, that, that's what I want to approach. That's what I want to go next. And, and of course, I'm giving you the super cliff versions, right? That oh, of course. Nice yeah. when I'm like, it's always more complicated yeah, when you open up, up the hood. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, there was definitely sleepless nights and, and all that good stuff. But but in the end, it's like, what's what's what I really want to get out of this? And then what is being uh, uh, offered to me in that moment in time to go for it, right? So you were uh, listening, though. You are listening to the needs and you're thinking, well, this is obviously there's some repetition here and yeah. what people are asking. There's, there's an, you know, how do I meet this need on, on a larger scale? And I think coaching, that makes sense. Packaging something, repurposing it, um, creating something that people can find, right? Mm -hmm. More easily. Mm -hmm. um, but was that process anxiety provoking for you? Because that requires a lot of, a lot of fortitude in terms of putting yourself out there, you know, and having the confidence to, to put your name on something like that. Yeah. 
I, I'll answer in two ways. One is 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 the the thrill of like meeting somebody new, pitching an idea, dissecting a new problem. That's fun for me, to be honest. Like that's super mm -hmm. exciting and that's thrilling. It's anxiety because you don't know where you're gonna go, right? But that's that's I think what what people most think about. Like oh, I don't, I wouldn't even know how to go do X, Y, Z. Um, but for me, I bigger more of a core of like, okay. If I really go venture and really do the consulting firm 100%, if I don't have a, a, a plan A, right, my full time job or teaching or whatever, like, can I really feed my kids with this, right? Can mm -hmm. I really like so? So I break it down to that level, and that creates a bit more anxiety, to be honest. Oh, sure. As compared as compared to the first one of like, oh man, I don't know how to pitch this to the board or something like that. That I'll figure out because I'll have to, right? Mm -hmm. It's more of like. And that's kind of what happened to us, Patrick, a year or so ago when we formally began um, Cilegra. Uh, a lot of folks that we had kind of in queue to do a program with us or a proposal or whatever, just asked us to halt and say, you know what, we, we got to figure this out and we're not spending any money on consultants, et cetera. Even though we had kind of been setting up and, and being ready to, to kind of launch, I don't know, maybe six, seven months when it was just kind of a dry spell and then we had to really reinvent is it just projects we're doing? Is it individual coaching we're doing? Is it group coaching, right? So we had, our, we had to innovate. And, and I think that was our, our mantra for ourselves. But whenever we met somebody, we said, hey, you got to innovate, right? You got to, if you're not set up for online, what can you do that gets you as close to it as you can, right? How can you go hybrid or how can you do it? Because honestly, if you don't innovate, you're going to sink big time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what size you are, uh, uh, individual or nonprofit, you know? Yeah, I mean, so you definitely had to kind of recreate your your business framework, your approach, mm -hmm. um, how you would market your services. Um, what is it? So, what does it look like now, Salegra? Um, a great question. I think it looks like we're going back to some people who we already had proposals queued up. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going back to some people who are saying, you know, we're about to open but we want to remain doing hybrid? Like, how do we end up doing both? Can you, can you look at our capacity? Can we look at any new ways we could onboard people or onboard systems? And we do that. Um, we're also kind of in, lately been in the in the eval biz where folks just say, hey, we, we, we just sort of flew the plane the past year and a half, but how can we capture some things that we did well so we can move forward? So we're doing some eval support there. Um, and just like everybody, to be honest, they're, they're kind of on a, you know, fifth gear, fourth gear, first gear situation because they they go, they speed up, they they hire, they let go, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it. We're going back to some trainings on culture humility, uh, burnout, uh, leadership management. It's just you know, at, at some point, your leaders are not you're just yours, right? But every leader is like ready to say, okay, I, I need a break, right? Like I need mm -hmm. to figure out what's going on with my own situation before I say let's all come back, given the pandemic, right? Like mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who who have taken a whole different way of self-care and are thinking about it a whole different way. And it's not just, is it the right price? Is it gonna be the right like distance? Is it the right population that I work with? I mean, there's a lot of people are going through it. Yeah. So we're just kind of listening and then we're just trying to take on projects that are that are successful that we've done before, but also more on the, on the track that we like doing the, the innovation piece, the seeking people of color and, and then again, to that small to mid-sized organizations. Yeah. So I'm curious: is your is is your business now more about B two B, where you're you're basically doing more program, um, you're analyzing other programs, evaluation for other you know other companies, or are you doing more um, consumer based work? It's definitely more B two B lately. Uh, that seems to where most of our quest stuff come in. Um, I personally enjoy that sort of, you know, myself and going to the consumer. Um, but right now we just define the consumer as the, the leader, as the ED or, or as, mm -hmm. uh, right? And that, that's, that's who our target folks are, um, as opposed to going to the youth, right? Mm -hmm. Or going to the parent or going to the foster youth. I mean, like, like we're, we're taking it sort of to the provider side and that seems to be heavy working lately. Um, yeah, there, there, there is... I don't know better or worse, but there are as much need in, in that field that as in everybody else. So, oh, of course, um, yeah, you know, they're ready and they're earning for it. Yeah, excellent. So that's, I mean, it's quite a journey, you know, 
where you, where you are now from where you were. Um, what would you like to see happen next? Like, where do you, where do you see your, your business going? Great question. Um, we you know we have these chats kind of my partner and I, my business partner and I have these weekly check-ins where we say, okay, well, we have this opportunity, this opportunity. And, um, you know, I, I do want to get comfortable where we're not quote unquote chasing uh, requests anymore or doing four or five proposals for one to hit, right? Like, just like everybody, right? We want to be as stable as possible. Um, so we definitely want to be following our own uh, recommendations, right? So mm -hmm. that we're not overburning ourselves and all that. Um, but honestly, I think I think there is an opportunity to work in the diversity, equity, inclusion space. You know, there, there's a lot of requests. There's a lot of director of this coming up. There's like uh, for-profit companies that are putting this. I, I think that there's an opportunity for us, social workers, people of color, to be in those roles or be an advisor or be in some sort of formulating that program. Or else, to be honest, it's going to feel more the same. You know, it's going to feel more like a... Um, and not to talk bad about social corporate or uh, social corporate enterprises, right? But it'll feel more of that, right? Let's go to the soup kitchen and Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. but then the rest of the year, nothing occurs. Right, just for sure. Right? So, or to scratch yeah. an itch, and, you know. Or just like a checkbox, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so, so I want to be more in that space, yeah. kind of down the, down, down the line. So I wonder if you could paint a picture of kind of what equity would look like or what what's your, you know, What's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow in terms of your mission? Oh, awesome. You know, it's, it's, it's hard uh, to put it in a sentence or so, but, but if there was a, a, a next big gig or next big project that would be amazing, it would be to really see and how could we be a support for, for a large company like, uh, like a Disney or like something that really has a hands in everything, right? Manufacturing, oh media, right? Like, like it's, it's really immense and it has cruises and it has, uh, like girls are watching uh, a movie mm. or something, right? So, so it has entertainment, it has everything, it has a lot of value to it. I could just only imagine if they really, you know, were behind something that, that was all encompassing and really talk to the employees, uh, got a pulse of the community that they were serving. And of course it is a, a company. I mean, of course it's gonna be bottom line, dollar mm -hmm. making, et cetera, right? But how much impact could that really happen as opposed to, um, I don't know, doing four or five K Mickey walks, right? Like I'm not mm -hmm. talking bad about Mickey walks, right? But like, like, is that money, is that service gonna be as impactful as opposed to them starting a uh, coding for girls system that was going to be directly going to right like there's a lot of potential partnerships that they could occur or they could have at that scale right so sure you know that that would be the pot of gold that would be that magic wand if i can make it happen tomorrow mm -hmm. right um yeah I, I think hopefully we're going to be there but it just takes a little while it and honestly it takes a bit more experiences to know the space to know the lingo to know the players because you know, uh, uh, manufacturing versus parks versus media versus radio. I mean, like they're all going to have different ways of, of, of analyzing their own need. You know, seems like that would be probably the most complex hurdle in this business yeah. is learning how to get the attention right of these the heads of these companies that you're pitching to. to yeah. You know, just to, just to get time to affect change or to get yeah. some buy-in, right? Yeah. 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 And I think I, because I, I don't, I'm not sure that I've seen it happen. Uh, maybe, maybe like where it came kind of top down, like Patagonia or, or, or some of these Apple initiatives, the, mm -hmm. the whole uh, going green type things. Um, but there's definitely more, right? There's definitely more that each of those companies could do and, and uh, from access to expenses to, to everything, you know? So. Yeah. Big gold, big, big pot of gold there. Yeah, fascinating work. I mean, it seems like you, you can go in so many directions when you're talking about glass ceilings, mm -hmm. upward mm -hmm. mobility, minority mm -hmm. groups. Yep. Um, I mean, you can get into micro minority groups, gender. I mean, it just goes on and on. Yeah, and yeah, pick, picking one, one population to serve or one particular goal within across the populations. You know, do you go a mile wide and an inch deep or do you go to, you know, Right. an inch wide and mile deep, you know, in terms of, of who you serve and how you go about it. It seems like to me that would, in the work that you're doing, that would probably be the most daunting thing, unless, unless you absolutely know this is the one 
particular need of this one population that I'm really trying to. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I, I hear you. And it's difficult, right? Because my, my heart changes all the time and every new news story comes out and every like, like it just it molds through the times. Um, but um, but I do have a soft spot for people that grew up in Boa Heights just because that's where I grew up, right? I do have a soft spot for people who are Latino and, and people who are first gen, right? But that, that soft spot is only as, as endearing as kind of like their attitude and they want to, to kind of put the work in. So, you know, that's, that's kind of who, who my, 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 my bottom line goes to, right? Like that's who mm -hmm. my heart belongs to. Right, absolutely. Um, certainly youth who are not d given the same opportunities for whatever reasons, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, be it socioeconomic issues, minority mm -hmm. issues, demographics. Uh, logistics um right. oftentimes they don't even know what their options are mm -hmm. so i can see yeah. how the education is a huge piece in terms of un even understanding you know right. from junior high on like what mm -hmm. you know because maybe their parent you know, nobody's in their family's ever gone to college or they don't even know what that right. looks like or right. what a career track looks like or the fact that college doesn't necessarily guarantee you a degree or a, a degree doesn't guarantee you a job or a career Right. Or it's an obsolete degree, right? Like if you want to go to nursing, you could also go to a vocational school. You could, like, it's not always, it's not always, equal. Um, no, no, it's not always equal and, and as accessible in, in every place uh, in, in every neighborhood, you know? Yeah. So I, I think it's fantastic that you're doing what you're doing. You know, you have, you've positioned yourself to help, you know, these populations is a fantastic, fantastic, um, service that you're doing i appreciate and, that thank you yeah absolutely and while i may not be you know a minority in that sense um i am in social work i'm a guy but <laughs> <laughs> right? right um but I, I i did come from a, um a very unorthodox background poverty that kind of thing and i was the first mm -hmm. one in my family to go to college and i don't think anybody expected me to finish high school so <laughs> yeah see there you go I had, so, to, so first... I had to figure thumb my way through it you know and it was pretty messy so. Yeah, first generous have like this unspoken talk. Like I know what you're talking. Like like what you just shared. Like mm -hmm. I get it, right? Like it's difficult and and it's hard to explain to the next gen, right? It's hard to explain. You know, it's not that whole. Uh, oh, when I was a kid, I would walk forty miles of snow. Like it's not that type of talk. No. It's more of like like when you're sitting in a classroom and and they ask about something, you you just kind of go into this whole mindset of like, oh man, am I supposed to know that? Did they, when when did they teach that? Right. Or, yeah. Right, like it's, it's those instances and as a um, that reflected so, appraisal constantly looking at yourself as tell you being judged or less than right or mm -hmm. someone's got, you're, someone's gonna find out you're a fraud yeah kind of big yeah. time <laughs> Patrick Patrick the first time I I owned like a version of a jacket or a warm coat was when I went to college like I lived here in, in LA my whole entire life right so mm -hmm. what does it get seventy two or sixty nine huh? sometimes right like. So when I went to the Bay Area, I, I said 58 or 57. I was like, I think I need something, you know, tougher here. And I had to go buy a jacket or something. Like those things, first generous get, right? Like, or, or when somebody first told me, oh, where's your accent from? And I was like, oh, man, LA? Is that an accent? Yeah. I don't know. Is that, is that, <laughs> right, is that right. a place? Like, do you get accent? So then I was like, no, no, but where are you from? And it was like these questions that were never asked for me before because mm -hmm. everybody that was around me was from the same place, right? Like right. we're all from LA. I know your dad. I know your mom. And, right. But it was when I left and what I called the four block radius, when I left that four block radius is where I realized, oh man, I'm a, I'm a little fish in this bigger world, right? Like, and, and, and that's fine. And I'm okay with that. Um, but yeah, it's really a big world out there. Yeah, most definitely. I think when I reflect on the fact that I never even stepped foot in a classroom until college, I never had a teacher, not once. Mm -hmm. um, you know, raised in RV parks, moving around, that kind of thing. Like I was mm -hmm. pseudo homeschooled, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. to a large point. And yeah. um, I just think I reflect on that sometimes of what that was like, you know, and right. having not had direction, how much it would have been nice to have a social worker or uh, a nonprofit or some kind of system mm -hmm. that I was exposed to that kind of showed, you know, prepared me for what to expect. Um, I think that's yeah. oftentimes taken for granted. Yeah, I had a, a local kind of boys and girls club in my area. Unfortunately, it was two big streets over where two kind of gangs were always going back and forth. So in order for me to get to the safe place, I had to cross 
a couple of non-safe places. Mm -hmm. So I just decided to retreat. I decided to be in home or I decided to go elsewhere around the neighborhood that wasn't going to be. So a lot of folks did get that support, like a boy and girls clubs or uh, maybe a church around the place. But it was always like, man, I had to like literally mind map. Okay, if I cross these two streets, well, that's that risk is not worth going in over there, right? So let me stay on the side. So right, yeah, I hear real. you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, very real. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's awesome, Patrick. And what about it when you um, first kind of stepped in the, in the classroom? You were mentioning um, was there a lot of self doubt on 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 your own capabilities? Like, was your own oh, self doubt yeah. on uh, could I do this? Absolutely, of course. I I didn't know what it was to have deadlines <laughs> <You know? laughs> on projects. You know, I mean. From the very most basic thing, I don't think I ever owned a yeah. planner until then. Yeah, you know, um, I didn't know how to how to organize my notes. I didn't, I and mean, there were so many things I just wasn't accustomed to. Right. Um, right. Even advocating myself to a teacher, you know, just cool. so much, you know, time, you know, yeah, studying for tests at you know certain timelines because that was yeah. everything was through correspondence up until that point, and there was very little mm. um, restraints in that sense. So yeah, it was definitely. Uh, but at the same time, the interesting things I loved. Like I was so thirsty for structure because I had no structure growing up, none, like zero practically. Yeah. So yeah. the the fact that college offered structure, I think is, was a huge pro, you know, was, I was willing to, to adjust. I was anxious to adjust. To, it was like a welcoming structure. Like you were ready for that. Yeah. Mm. Interesting how, you know, your background plays a part into how we, how we take on challenges and how we adapt. No, big time. And I, I've always shared that in class or even in colleagues is that you can have twins, same house, same birthdays mm -hmm. and everything, potentially same uh, genetic type, right? But it's it's two different experiences, right? They're just molded totally different. Um, and that's kind of the whole ancient debate, right? Nature versus nurture. And, you know, I, I think it's half, right? It's half of what you have genetically, you know, that good stuff, but it's mm -hmm. off of uh, your your lived experience and, and what you oh, go certainly. through, et cetera. Like like it's it's not and or it's, it's a both. You know? I think too how we and you know our schema how we internalize our experiences versus see them as opportunities or how malleable we view the world is right versus how fixed that those challenges yeah. are, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I th again, I just, you know, I have a a special place in my heart for the work you're doing in terms of being a voice for those who would not otherwise even though they needed a voice mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah yeah no, no no likewise and i think what i most recently have been joining lately is um supporting students who are are about to venture out because I, I teach primarily graduate school but it's students who are about to go get their quote-unquote first professional job so up until then they were i don't know baristas or you know they, they mm -hmm. were maybe in the human services but they were the, the the screener or the, or the case manager, right? Like they always felt like their work wasn't as a par with a therapist or a director or whatever. And I challenged that often. I said, you know, you're going to have a lot more keys to that car or to the house that you think. Like when you get in there, you're going to be like, oh man, I really knew all this stuff. I just called it something else, right? Or right. I just experienced right. it differently. Or, or now that I have both perspectives, I get to throw in a whole new, fresh way of doing things. And um so yeah that that's lately what i've been in, in really enjoying and seeing people's aha moments and those light bulbs and asking them hey keep it on or keep it in the back because you're gonna you're gonna use that fairly soon absolutely that's great great advice um so i'm wondering you know for any of those who are listening or watching this interview um what would you impart to them in terms of nuggets of wisdom like what would you have them take away from your your experience your mission oh um, I think two things. One is, is is being okay with with listening to yourself and listening to what are your strengths and what you're good at. There's a there's a fixed mindset that we have that we have to be this X Y Z type person by this age by by this career path but you know but just really listen to the journey and see where you're at. Um, shift, pivot, you know, down gear, up gear, whatever you need to be doing, but just be listening to it because there's a reason why you're in that path, literally. Um, and again, if you quote unquote make the wrong choice, you'll never know what the right choice was going to be, anyways, right? So mm. once you made that choice, that's it. Like stick to that mm. and keep going. Yeah. Um, because I, I think that's that's better than dwelling on why well, I should have, I could have, well, I didn't right. do it, right? Or I'm too old, I'm too young, whatever those like little voices are. So just kind of push through and keep going. Uh, 
the, the second big nugget, hopefully, is, is I'm, I'm sharing as much as I can, but definitely be able to pull up somebody with you, right? Whether it's a family member, whether it's a colleague or a student of yours or whatever you're able to do, whoever you're able to influence is just pull up somebody with you because one, they're going to make you better. And then two, you're just making it that much better, right? You, you, you're, you're splitting the pie a bit more than just, you know, kind of selfishly taking that on for yourself just for the glory of it. Or just Because mm -hmm. there's definitely enough work to go out there. There's definitely enough need to go out there. There's no reason why it should just be you, right? So uh, those two things, I think, I, I, I hope people are kind of just not listening to how I'm doing, but I see how I'm doing, right? Like th that they see that I do it in my, in my consulting work, that I see that I do it with, when I'm teaching, um, so that I'm modeling it and not just saying it in, in cool interviews, right? That, that it's actually happening. I love that. It reminds me of saying that, you know, no one's, no one's better until we're all better, right? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 I probably no, slaughtered that I, quote, but. <laughs> no, I, but I but I got the gist and I think the other one that I it's similar to it right but if you want to go far go by yourself right but if you sorry if you want to go fast go by yourself right. if you want to go far take people with you I love that yes right? yes because because fast is, is what we think right I want that that fast job or that high mm -hmm. paying job or I want whatever that is right and cool you might get there right but how many people are you going to step over right just to get that right the or first how many, one yeah yeah, or how many uh, relationships you're going to lose or X, Y, Z, right? But if you want to go a little further than that one big job, right? If you want to be an owner, if you want to like run two or three things and take more people with you, right? Or learn from people or mm -hmm. it's okay to people, people ahead of you, right? Yeah. It's going to be fine. Absolutely. You know? It's a group effort. Well, okay. I love that. Um, so where can our listeners find uh, more out about you? What can they, uh, any website, any social media? Yes, please. I'll, I'll plug you uh, our website. Our website is www.silegra.org. And uh, the play out word there is it's my first name backwards. It's at Haley's backwards. Hmm. Um, forever and ever and ever because I have a, a sort of Spanish um, name, right? People couldn't say at Haley's, but they could say Silegra. And I always thought that <laughs> I was, was wondering where that name came from. <laughs> Because Silegra to me sounds harder to say, right? It doesn't really mean anything. It has like a empty thing, but people got it, right? It so yeah. <laughs> it rolls off the tag. It doesn't feel threatening as Argelis, right? So um, so you can find me there. But also our all our handles are at Silegra underscore org. So if you want to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, we're pretty uh, uh Instagram and LinkedIn, we're, we're more sort of active on those. Uh we have Twitter and all that, but and those tend to be where we have most of our exchanges and most of our posting. So awesome. yeah, I'll please definitely feel, link up for all of that. On. Yeah. In the awesome. show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. I was wondering, um, would it be okay if I did a follow-up down the road? See how things yes, are going. Of course. Of course. Please, please right. let's, let's chat a year, three years, five years from now. Let's yeah. see how, how much Disney heard this podcast, right? Or uh, let's see how far we hey, went. Well, Disney, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a podcaster. We're ready. You need an executive coach. <laughs> exactly. No, no. Appreciate that. Thank you, Patrick, for having me on. And good luck with everything. And please, please uh, support Patrick and all the great work he's doing as well. well you wouldn't be too, uh, you wouldn't mind if Google picked you up though, right? No. No, they Google's good. Right? <laughs> Is that good for the algorithm? Google. Google. I think Google. You have to say it three times and then you have to clap twice, I heard. Or, I don't all right. Know. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right, thank you. Absolutely. Maybe it's like the, maybe it's like the Nintendo where you have to hold something for a long time and it's supposed to be pressing. All oh, right, huh? Like maybe we're pressing. doing something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like a cheat code we don't know yet. I know, huh? What a world we live in. I'm I know. Well, thank you, Patrick. <laughs> it's an honor and a privilege to to talk with you. Um, I wish you all the best. Enjoy your day, Likewise. your week, and I'll check in with you down the road. Okay. Great. Thank you, Patrick. All right. Thank Have you. A great day. You too. Bye. Well, there you have it, another tool to help you thrive. I hope you found value in this content, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and share with your friends. And until next time, go make good things happen. Bye-bye now.